Once upon a time, so long ago it's hard to remember, there was a count who was wealthy, who had a grand mansion and hundreds and hundreds of acres of land to call his own. He had very few friends, however, for he had an evil disposition. The friends that he had were all sycophants. They were just interested in him for his money and for his influence and power. One day, the Count took it upon himself to marry, and he chose a young woman. There was a girl in the, in the town who was witty, intelligent, bright, musical, gay, fun to be with. And she had long golden hair. He wasn't so much in love with her, but there was something about her hair that he liked. And so it was her that he was going to marry. He went to the girl's parents and asked for her hand in marriage, and they agreed. He was wealthy. It would be a good thing for their daughter and for them. But the daughter did not want to marry the Count. Her heart was with another the farmer's boy and his heart was with her. They loved each other dearly, deeply, passionately. And she told the Count this, I cannot love you, I love someone else. And when she told him that it was the farmer, the Count decided that it would be an easy deed to do to get rid of his rival suitor. So one dark night, he waited for the boy and in the shadows of an alleyway attacked him with his sword. But the farmer's boy was no weakling and he had himself a dagger and he protected himself with that dagger and in the ensuing fight killed the Count. And when he pulled the body of the Count out of the alley and into the light of an oil lamp that was burning and saw who he had killed he realised that his own life was in great danger. For if the friends of the Count found out, if they didn't kill him, they would take him to court and he would be hung. And so he rode on his grey mare to his sweetheart and told her what had happened. He told no one else, but fled, having told her that he would return in three years. He would never, he said, be as rich as the Count, but he will find himself good work and good money and return to marry her. And so she waited. First year she heard nothing, the second year she heard nothing. But then in the third year a note was given to her by a boy in the marketplace. He handed her the note and she read it. And the note said that he would come at midnight or thereabouts, under the full moon to meet her once more, and her heart pounded. She looked forward with excitement to seeing him, to leaving with him. She packed a few belongings, the few precious things that she had, into a small bundle and waited. Her parents went to sleep. The moon came out full and bright, and she heard the thundering of hooves, and she saw a grey mare coming towards the house, and upon its back a rider, shadowed in the light of the moon. As the horse got closer, a cloud covered the moon, and the night was made darker still. The horse came to a halt outside the front of her house, and with a small bag of belongings, she ran outside. The rider's hand pulled her up behind him, the hand cold in the night, and she held herself close to the back of her true love as he swung the horse around and rode off into the night. The horse thundered over the hills. They passed a graveyard, and she thought she heard voices calling from the grave heart, graveyard, why do you ride behind the dead. She looked behind her, but there was no one there. 
They rode on and on into the night. Darkness flashing by as the moon came out and hid and came out behind clouds. On and on they rode past another graveyard and again the voices called out, why do you ride behind the dead? She turned but there was nobody behind them. And on and on they rode until a third graveyard they passed. And the voices and the laughter seemed harsher than the other two. And again, a voice clearer than the rest called out, why do you ride behind the dead? I do not ride behind the dead, she called out. I ride behind my true love. And the rider's head turned and the hood was pulled back by the wind. And she saw that it was not her true love, but the face of the Count. The girl screamed in horror and she tried to leap from the moving horse, a dangerous thing to do. But the Count was too fast and he grabbed hold of her hair and caught her before she hit the ground. She was pulled back against the flanks of the horse. Her hands came up to grab hold of his hand to try and take some of the pain, take some of her own weight. And they rode on and on banging she was against the horse, screaming out for help, but they were nowhere, there was no one to help her, until she heard the sound of more hooves, and the clouds departed from the sky, and the night was clear and bright with the moon, and she saw it was the farmer's boy, her true love riding closer and closer and she screamed for help holding one hand out toward him please help me rescue me she called the count laughed and when she turned to look she saw rising up out of the ground these great fiery gates the gates of hell and they were swinging open the farmer's boy rode harder and harder and harder but they were getting closer to the gates of hell, those fiery, fiery entrance ways. Closer and closer they became. The boy reached out his hand, she reached out hers. And then with his other hand, he pulled the sword from the scabbard that he carried and swung at the arm of the count. He severed the girl's hair caught her in his hand and pulled her up to his chest, stopping the horse as the Count rode between the fiery gates of hell, which slammed closed. But the Count had what he wanted, the golden hair. And the boy had what he wanted, the girl with the golden hair, although it was now much shorter. And the girl had what she wanted, her true love. What makes the story a little bit better was that in those three years he'd become a very successful artisan and did very well. And they lived together happily. But the story doesn't quite end there. You see, after the Count had died, the retainers, the servants left one after the other, for there was no one to pay them. The house started to fall into disrepair after a terrible storm and a fallen tree, the roof broken in the house began to rot and decay and fall apart. And those hundreds and hundreds of acres, nobody went there. There were rumours of the ghosts of the Count. Nobody dared go there, even to poach. Strange noises were heard upon the grounds, even with no groundsmen there, no ground keepers. But men being men, over a pint of beer, two decided that they would poach the deer that were there in the forest. Their families were hungry. And so on a moonlit night, they went into the woods, onto the land of the dead count, and poached his meat. But that night, two screams were heard, terrifying screams. Not the kind of screams that make you run outdoors to see if you can help. 
but the kind of screams that send you shivering cold, the kind of screams that have you lock the door, shut the windows, bolt the shutters. The next day a number of men and the priest went to look for their two friends. They found them. The one was dead, frozen with his hands like claws in front of his face as if trying to keep something away. The other man barely alive, his face ashen, his hair as silver as the moon that had been up in the sky that night, raving and ranting, trying to push something away from him. When people went to approach him, he fought them off. Three men it took to bind him in leather straps, to protect him from himself and protect themselves from him. They covered the man's face, the dead man's face, with one of their coats. The eyes were bulging, the face contorted in terror, they could not look upon it. He was buried in the church, as was the man with the ashen face and the hair as silver as the moon, for he died a few days later. And since then, from that day to this, no one trespasses on the Count's land at night. No one. Golden hair and the Count. <laughs>